on guys thank you so much for joining me today on vicious whispers with mark tullius that is me your wonderful fun loving host maybe not fun loving eh, sometimes lots of times i'm pretty fucking dark but for the most part i try to be fun loving um something i work on don't want to be all grumpy all the fucking time which i used to be um now i'm much less grumpy so anyhow I'm your host. Thank you guys so much for listening. Hopefully you guys have checked out other episodes. Uh, today's episode is going to be about nonfiction. Uh, we're definitely having a fiction story at the end. I'm pulling one from Twisted Reunion. It'll be Twisted Memory. That will be at the end of the episode. But first I want to talk a little bit about nonfiction projects. Um, my first one was Unlocking the Cage, which I never really wanted to do. Um, I mean, I did want to do it, but I also knew it was going to take a lot of time. It ended up taking up much, much, much more time than I thought. I went to 23 states, uh, 100 gyms, interviewed th- all together like over 400 people. I think it was 340 fighters and a bunch of coaches and everything else. So all that took a lot of time, uh, editing those videos, watching those videos, writing the book. Um, very time consuming. The overall project was probably the best thing I've done in my life. It got me out of my shell. I've always been an introvert. That forced me to uh, go and meet people, talk to people, change the way I view mixed martial artists, help me understand myself. The reason I wrote the book was to figure out why I had been fighting. Why was I so fucked up that I was getting in the cage, even when I wasn't any good, um, to box and to fight uh, MMA. Um, So that uh, that was a reason for it. And it was, yeah, again, incredibly worth it. Um, It definitely postponed lots of my fiction, really slowed it down. Uh, For example, Ain't No Messiah, I started back in 2000, I think 11 or 2010, and it's only coming out now. Um, It's much better because of that, because I grew so much in that process. Um, But it definitely postponed a lot of stuff, slowed things down. Um, I think that's part of the hesitation with doing another nonfiction project. Um, this one is going to be about traumatic brain injuries and how we deal with them. If we can rewire our brain, if we can recover, or if we can simply find ways to deal with our symptoms. Um, now, I can't say 100% for sure that I have brain damage, but... We'll, we'll go into that a little bit more. Um, I think I I really, one, I, I and this is, this is kind of how I felt with Unlocking the Cage. I felt like I was not the right person to write the book because one, um, I wasn't a good fighter. So I felt like, well, if I wasn't a good fighter, then I don't really deserve to write this story. Um, the other part was, fucking, I'm not, I don't write nonfiction. Um, I also had never interviewed anyone in my life, hadn't used a camera, hadn't used a video recorder, any of that stuff. Didn't know how any of that shit worked. Um, but so I had all these reasons why I should not do it. Uh, but I, and one of them was just feeling like I wasn't smart enough to do it either. Uh, that's something that I always tell myself. The story in my head is that I'm an idiot. Um, and so that is sometimes hard to overcome. But meeting all these people, hearing all their stories, uh, so much inspiration, uh, so many new friends. It was awesome. Now with this book, uh, the nonfiction project with the brain, um, originally, I'm not sure exactly when I got the idea to do it. I know during Unlocking the Cage, one of my buddies, my friend Brian Esquivel, who was going around and filming me, um, he would go to lots of gyms with me, help with interviews, take photos and stuff. One day after we were at headquarters, uh, 10th Planet headquarters in LA, and I just gotten done sparring, he asked me if I had looked into brain damage. And I was like, mm, not really. And uh, he's like, well, maybe you should. And he was cool about it, but he was pointing out like, hey man, these young kids are beating the fucking shit out of you. You're getting killed by these dudes. Like, I got my ass kicked by Fabricio Verdum, uh, Hanato Babalu, uh, all these different guys, professional fighters, and of course, they weren't going 100% on me, but I took some shots that were fucking very hard, uh, had some concussions, and this is at 42, 43 years old, on top of all the fucking other concussions I've had. 
Um, I've been knocked unconscious at least eight times through uh, in high school football, college football, and uh, fighting and boxing. Um, and those, and that might sound like a lot, but that's nothing compared to the daily. Uh, what you would just ha have happen in a regular session. So even if you're not getting knocked out, like fucking you're still getting concussions left and right, or at least I did. Um, for a while, when I was trying to box professionally, I was slurring my speech. Uh, my words were constantly getting mixed up. I'm very grateful that that shit stopped, um, but it was uh, very scary. Um, and lately I've had talks with several, uh, well, three football players that I actually lined up against, that I would practice against their offensive linemen, that I would bash heads with um, at Brown University. These guys did not go on to do any other combat sports. They didn't take any more damage. And all three of them are, they have TBI, they have traumatic brain injury. They are dealing with uh, CT symptoms. Um, their brain is kind of screwed up and I think it's only gonna get worse. And these are just three guys that contacted me. These aren't, like, I didn't reach out and just do a survey of all the guys on my team that I played with or of other football players or, um, these are guys that just reach out to me and said, hey man, my brain's fucked. I'm in this study, I'm in this study. Um, I'm scared, I don't know what the fuck I'm gonna do. So, and then on top of that, there's all these MMA fighters that I've met. All these guys that I'm now friends with, some of them writing to me saying that they're you know, fucking, they don't know what they're going to do. Some are suicidal, some. Um, and so it is scary. I uh, made a lot of friends. And to know that lots of them are probably going to develop uh, brain issues sucks. Um, I, when I was fighting, I didn't give a shit. I was suicidal most of my life. I didn't care about riding a motorcycle. I didn't care about anything. I was actually looking forward to death. thought I would have been dead by 24. But now that... Um, I'm older, I have kids, I found my passion with writing. I was like, fuck, I want to write till the day I die. And now, fuck, maybe I'm going to be sitting there drooling shit in a diaper. So, um, definitely a little bit scary. Uh, the good thing is, I, I've already done testing with a Cleveland Clinic in Vegas, which has been awesome. I've interviewed that doctor. We've done two sets of tests. Um, it's been a little over a year, so I'm going to go back in again interview him one more time, go through the battery of tests, see how I've progressed or declined or whatever over the last year. Uh, so that's a little scary. Um, and it's also been a year since I started the program with Dr. Mark Gordon and his daughter Allison. Uh, they were on the Joe Rogan podcast. I had reached out to them after I saw that podcast because they're making incredible changes in all these veterans with PTSD. I thought they'd be interesting for the book. I didn't think I needed it. I didn't think I was dealing with any brain damage stuff or any symptoms. Um, but two weeks after the I started their protocol, man, um, I was actually sitting outside and I started crying because I was like, holy shit, I had no idea I was as bad as I was. I, um, I didn't know my depression was so fucking bad. I didn't know my anxiety was so high. I didn't know all these things were that bad until they were gone or they were very, very, very reduced. Um, so I'm incredibly grateful for them. Um, I'm anxious to see what my uh, blood work looks like. I'll probably get that some, done sometimes this month, sometime in this month. Um, after I have that blood work, I will take that to the Cleveland Clinic, do the testing there. And then one of my football buddies, he's in the Mayo Clinic um, study, and I want to go talk with that doctor and hopefully go through a series of their tests as well. Um, and so that's going to be a big part of the book. Um, and on top of that, we will have all be interviewing different, um, different specialists in different areas that are very important to the brain. Uh, one will be, there'll be a chapter on sleep. Uh, the importance of that is huge. Um, yesterday I interviewed my yoga instructor, Jessie Schiff, Schiffmacher, who um, I had gone to her depression workshop. Her and a psychotherapist were putting on, uh, it was a three-part series with depression, anxiety, and stress, and how yoga and mindfulness can make a difference. And so we had a really good talk yesterday about how helpful that can be. Um, yoga is definitely a huge part of my life now, something I need. If I don't do it, if I don't do the mindfulness, um, it definitely makes an impact on me. 
Um, what other kind of chapters are we going to have? Um, we'll have some on like electrical stimulation uh, or the magnetic treatment, different types of treatments for the brain. Um, I really got to dig into it. I put everything on pause while I was doing uh, Beyond Brightside. Part of it was because of the writing. The other part is the fear. Like, do I really want to know if I, yeah, okay, my decline started. It's only going to get worse. Do I want to know that shit? Yes, I do. Um, and, and one of the things that with my buddy who is the one from uh, in the Mayo Clinic, he also just recently was uh, diagnosed with leukemia and he's dying and he's decided he's not going to do his uh, any more chemo because it wasn't working. It's probably it might prolong his life a little bit, but it is uh, his quality of life wouldn't be there. So he's just making this decision that he's going to enjoy life. He's going to enjoy every moment he has. Um, and I was telling him, like, man, I'm inspired by that. That's how I'm trying to live my life. I was already trying to think that way, but now seeing it in motion, seeing someone I know going through it and dealing with it like that, I was like, that's, uh, that's powerful. So he will be, uh, part of the book. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that's kind of what is going on with the brain issue. Um, like I feel good. I feel fine. Sometimes I feel unstable. Sometimes, you know, there's there's so many different reasons why that could be going on too. Like my wife often says, you know, I seem fine. Like I don't have any of these symptoms, but I don't know if she would uh, recognize them. And then, you know, and how many have gone away. And another part of this too is uh, one of the chapters will be on uh, psychotherapy. I've been going to therapy for a year almost and I know that has made a huge difference as well uh, really looking at all these different things um, and understanding like okay yeah this came from there and this came from there and maybe maybe the trauma early on to my brain intensified everything maybe it had made me more violent maybe but who knows maybe I was fucking born that way so there's so many different factors involved um, it's hard to know where stuff came from that's what I discovered with unlocking the cage. Like there wasn't one reason why people fight. There's not one answer like, okay, that's why I went into it. It was because of this. Um, you know, there's just so, so many different factors. Um, and I think that's what we're gonna see with the brain stuff. Like, okay, is it, uh, are you just lucky or unlucky if you start developing the towel and you have the, these issues going? Um, you know, are certain people more susceptible? Like what, what's, what's the reason why some people can fucking play football all their life and won't get it? Although I don't think that's even true. And that's what I need to listen to the last uh, interview I did with uh, Dr. Brinick. Um, but I think he was saying like, if you play pro football, you're going to have brain damage. Um, you may not develop CTE, but you're going to have some brain damage for sure. You can't play a sport like that and not have it. Um, I don't believe I will or... I don't believe I'll let my son play. I will strongly discourage it. Um, but then there's also that argument that you can get hurt doing anything. He was just doing jiu-jitsu the other day and his neck popped really bad. Uh, the other kid did something that he probably shouldn't have been doing. There was, wasn't part of their drill. Jake popped up off the mat after he tapped and he was crying. He ran over to me. His neck was really bad. Um, had to go. To, he wanted to go to the chiropractor. I wanted to take him. But he was the one who insisted, was like, yeah, I need to go to the chiropractor. And I'm glad we went. We went to Dr. Holland in La Habra, who I've been going to for 31 years. And he was surprised. He's like, oh, my gosh. He's like, he couldn't believe how far the vertebrae had moved. Um, but he put him right back into place. Um, so it was scary. It's, it's scary allowing kids to do anything where they might get hurt. Um, Jiu-Jitsu has its risks. But it's not like football where you're fucking pounding. You're getting your head pounded. Um and even with the, the safer helmets, even with uh, more safety when people are getting concussions and everything else, I think the risk is too high. Um, having friends that are suffering uh, with this brain damage and knowing I'm going to have so many more, yeah, I'm not a not huge fan of fo football anymore. Um, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a pro football player. That was my dream. Um, I loved being able to play in uh, college. That was awesome being able to play at Brown. But... Um, there are other ways to have fun, excitement, uh, where I'm not destroying my brain. Um, yeah, I can't really think of too much else. I'll get back into this, um, oh, probably over the next month or so. I'm going to finish up Brightside and then dig deeper into uh, the brain stuff and then actually start working on writing it. 
Uh, this one's going to be probably a lot more personal. Um, unlocking the cage, I left out a good amount of stuff, I think. Uh, stuff that I didn't think the reader necessarily needed to know about me. But I think in this brain one, um, if I'm going to be honest, if I want it to be a real book, uh, then I will probably reveal a little bit more. Um, lots of stuff I'm probably already talked about on here and my old podcast unlocking um, but it's a little bit different when you actually put stuff into put it on the page so I have my work cut out for me but at least I know it will be um, it'll be useful it'll be beneficial it'll be good for me to do if nothing else and then hopefully other people are gonna benefit from it as well um, and even if they didn't just the thought that I am trying to do something to help them hopefully that will uh, will be enough one too. All right, guys, it's been a long day. Um, I'm ready to get some work done, then go pick up my kids and have some fun with them. Um, but first, we need to leave you with a story. Today, we're going to do Twisted Memory from Twisted Reunion. Uh, deals a little bit about uh, with that fear of losing your mind. All right, guys, hopefully you enjoy the story. Stick around next week. Don't know what the story will be. Uh, probably pick out a, a horror one again. We'll see. Maybe there'll be something new. Not sure. But uh, only one way to find out. All right, guys. Thank you so much for listening. Hope you have a great week. I will talk to you later. Peace. Twisted Memory The key wouldn't turn. The goddamn lock was always sticking. Tom slid out the key to examine it, making sure he had the right one, and then he shoved it back in. The deadbolt still wouldn't move. Tom pounded his fist against the door. Gina, open up! That bitch must have changed the lock while he was out. He banged his fist again. A man shouted from inside the apartment. What the hell's going on? She had a man in his apartment? Open the goddamn door! Huge, clonking footsteps came toward him, and the door whipped open. A heavy-set Hispanic man filled the doorway. With a scowl on his face, he asked, What the hell's your problem? Tom's heart was pounding so hard, he didn't even hear his fist striking the man's mouth. The man stumbled backward into the apartment. Tom followed, slammed the door shut behind him, and ran after the guy, who was trying to hide behind the couch. Tom grabbed the guy's collar, and looked into his soulless eyes. Gina and this asshole probably laughed about Tom when they had sex. Before the bastard could ask for forgiveness, Tom threw a devastating elbow at his head. A loud crack filled the apartment. The man's legs gave. Tom dropped him and rammed a knee into his chest, then shoved him into the cheap particle board entertainment center. An ancient 13-inch tube television set crashed to the floor next to the broken man. Tom wondered where his 42-inch flat screen and the mahogany piece it sat on had disappeared to. Figuring Gina had let her lover sell Tom's stuff for crack money, Tom yelled for her. Get out here, Gina! He stood over the crumpled man, woke him with a kick. Get out here now, Gina, or you're going to end up like your boyfriend! The man spit out a mouthful of blood and held his jaw as he mumbled, No one's here! Fuck, man, you got the wrong place. Tom kicked him in his thigh. She's got ten seconds. You better call her. There's no Gina here. Never even heard of her. The man used his shoddy entertainment center to get back to his feet. He motioned to the frames on the wall. This is my place. Look at the pictures. Not about to look away and get sucker punched, Tom pushed the man's chest, sending him into the hallway. He planned on knocking the damn liar out when he rebounded off the wall, but the bastard must have seen it coming, somehow stopping himself and taking off down the hallway, racing for the bedroom. Tom flew after him before the man could get hold of Gina or call the cops, but the guy was already shutting the door behind him. Tom threw his body at it before it closed all the way. A loud grunt came from the other side of the door as it popped open, spilling Tom inside the strangely decorated bedroom. There were balloons all over the walls, something Gina must have done earlier that morning. The intruder spun his arms and stopped himself before hitting the crib. 
Why is there a crib? Tom thought as the man picked up the cordless phone in his left hand and a baseball bat in the other. Put my shit down now, Tom yelled, even though he didn't recognize the bat. It was bright red. Tom realized it was plastic. I'm calling the cops. Tom could barely contain a chuckle. <laughs> You're going to call the cops on yourself? I don't think so. Put my shit down, and maybe I'll let you leave. Back off, the man waved the bat back and forth. I mean it. Tom took another step, the length of the crib between them. So do I. You got any idea how fucked you are? The deluded guy looked down at his bat. Tom lunged forward, placed one hand on the end of the bat, and twisted, the robber's wrist snapping in a satisfying crunch. The robber's surprised cry was silenced when Tom chucked the bat and began pummeling the side of the man's head until his arm grew heavy. The loud smacks splashing blood over Tom's face. The man was begging him to stop through his sliced lip when a baby cried. Tom let the man drop next to the light blue dresser and walked over to the crib. A baby, red-faced and squishy, wailed. What the hell is this? Tom asked. It's my kid, man. Come on, please. I, I don't know any Gina. A quick search reassured Tom that Gina wasn't there for some unknown reason. He picked up the brown leather wallet that the amateur had left on the entryway table and stuffed it into his front pocket. Figured he should hold on to it just in case. He didn't even know. His head was spinning as he walked out. The mid-morning sun blinded him as he walked onto the sidewalk. Disoriented, he looked up and down the block, searching for his convertible Boxster. He clearly remembered parking on the north side of the street, but his car was nowhere to be found. I drove it, didn't I? Tom could still hear the baby crying inside his head. He dug his keys out of his left pocket, tossing aside a one-way bus ticket from Folsom he must have picked up by accident. He went to press the panic alarm on the remote, only to realize there was no remote. His shiny apartment key and a worn key for Gina's Honda were all that was left. The Porsche key must have fallen off the ring earlier that morning. Some rotten son of a bitch must have come across it and stolen the car. Instead of making himself sick thinking about it, Tom decided he would file a report with the police after he found Gina. He had to make sure she was okay. If he was so materialistic that he placed his car above her, he didn't deserve to be called her boyfriend. A cab turned the corner. Tom had his first break of the day, flagging it down with a wave of his finger. It wasn't until he slid into the passenger side of the back seat and the driver asked him where he was headed that Tom realized he had no idea where he could find Gina. The bald cabbie looked into his rear view. You doing okay, brother? My girl. I need to find her. Make sure she's all right. Not a problem. Where she live? Tom motioned toward the apartment he'd just come out of. With me. At least she did until this morning. Her stuff's gone. Damn, tough break. The cabbie turned his attention back to the street. So where you want to go? I don't know. Someone stole my Porsche. After a brief hesitation, the cabbie asked, You got any money? Because uh, I ain't running a charity carriage. Yeah, Tom said, having no idea if he did or didn't. With everything that had happened, he was scared to look in his wallet. Then he remembered the guy and the baby. Sure enough, two hundred bucks and some change. So, where to? Tom looked back at the street, at the apartment building. It did look different than he remembered. The cabbie said, Any idea where she might be? I kinda gotta get moving. Sirens sounded in the distance. Go ahead and drive up the street a bit. You got an address? I need to radio it in. Her sister lives in Santa Clarita, pretty close to Six Flags. Gina might be with her. That's an hour away. I got the money. All that mattered was Gina. Tom took the cash and waved it in the air for the cabbie to see.
Raising his voice so he could be heard above the approaching sirens, Tom said, This is more than enough. Here's a twenty in case you think I'm going to stiff you. I just need to stop at a phone booth first and get her sister's address. The cabbie told him to keep it as he started the meter, pulled away from the curb, and headed north. When Tom put the bills back into his wallet, he noticed that the back of his hand was speckled with bright red drops. By the time the cabbie found a phone booth with a directory inside it, Tom had wiped the drops off his hands, did the best he could with the spots on the front of his denim jacket. It didn't take him long to find Gina's sister in the book, but there was a surprise. Her address was listed as Pasadena, not Santa Clarita. Gina never mentioned her sister was considering moving. Tom ripped the page from the directory and got back into the cab. Good news, she's not far from here. You sure it's the right person? You want to try calling her? It's her. I'd rather just show up. Ten minutes later, the cab stopped in front of an unfamiliar house. The cabbie motioned toward the red Porsche 911 in the driveway and chuckled. Is that your car? No. Why? Eh, you said yours was stolen. I thought maybe your girl took it. My car's in the shop. I hate blue. Yeah, yeah, all right, all right. The cabbie checked the meter. That'll be sixty dollars. The cabbie studied Tom to see if he was aware that he was ripping him off. Tom tossed him a hundred and got out of the cab. Do me a favor and keep it running. I might need a ride back. He headed for the porch before the cabbie could say no. The front door opened. Joan, whose hair was now streaked with gray, was on her cell phone. Her jaw dropped mid-sentence when she recognized Tom. Surprise. I didn't know you guys moved. You should have told me. She sounded like a robot when she said, I've got to go. She hung up and started dialing someone new, probably the cops. Tom ripped the cell from her hand, tossed it on the grass. He was about to ask Gina when he noticed the silver necklace around Joan's neck. That's Gina's. No, it's mine. I gave it to her for our anniversary. Joan slowly shook her head. You shouldn't be here. I can't believe they let you out. Not knowing who they were or from where they had supposedly let him out, Tom focused on the necklace. There was no denying the G-inscribed heart pendant belonged to Gina. Tom took a step into the doorway. Where is she? Joan shrieked and tried to slam the door on Tom. Not about to let some nutty chick get the best of him, Tom lowered his shoulder and drove forward, knocking Joan back into her house. He shut the door and pinned Joan against the wall before she could scream. What the hell's your problem? I'm looking for Gina to make sure she was okay. She wasn't at home. Joan tried to slap him, but he knocked her hand away. Stop it, he said. I'm trying to protect her. Where is she? Joan tore at his face with her free hand. Tom grabbed each of her wrists and crushed them against the wall. Tell me where she is. You sick fuck! Joan kneed Tom's groin, folded him over. He lost his grip on Joan, and she dashed to the phone in the kitchen, picked it up, and punched three buttons. Tom ignored the pain, fought the urge to vomit. Hang up the phone, Joan. Joan backed up to the wall her eyes looking around her, probably searching for a weapon. She took a deep breath and said she needed help. She said Tom's name. Tom stepped toward her. Tell them you called by mistake and that everything's okay. He's a convicted murderer. He killed my sister twelve years... Tom yelled. Hang it up and give me Gina's necklace. He kept screaming, trying to block out Joan's words repeating in his head. Killed my sister. Joan begged the dispatcher to hurry. Tom didn't ask any more questions. She obviously wasn't ready to tell him where Gina was. He tore the landline off the wall, wrapped his hands around Joan's throat. It was so soft, just like Gina's. Tom closed the front door behind him, then got into the cab. The driver eyed him and asked if everything was okay. No, but she was here, 
he held up the necklace and said, She left this by accident. Her sister asked if I could return it to her. So, where to? Tom stuffed the necklace into his pocket, noticing he hadn't got all that sticky red paint off. Her mom and dad live nearby, 